Over the last few weeks, I've had this 180 shift in what I think about tech conferences. Not long ago, I made a video where my conclusion was essentially that tech conferences were not worth it. I don't think so. I don't think it's gonna happen in a conference. I put that on my personal channel. And now I sort of have to take that back. You know, my main problem back then with, with attending these things was ROI. For you as an individual, when you, when you think about the plane ticket and, and the hotel and the ticket to the conference and the foot pain from walking all day, $2,000, $3,000 in exchange for some networking? I mean, can you quantify that in some way? It's I mean, anyway, you slice it, it's a very hefty price. And even for a company, so last month we flew six people from, from our team to San Francisco to attend Saster. And our bill came to around $12,000 all in. We tried to get more value out of the trip than just a conference. And I think that we did, but it's still a lot of money. And that's nothing compared to what companies are spending to host a booth and to give away some swag. So all said and done, I mean, it's at least 70. So I sat down with, with a couple of startups to understand not only why they do it, but how it's somehow become one of their key outreach tactics. You know, I will tell you, when I heard that the team was gonna go to Saster, my first thought was no. Okay. And I was like, hon. And then they're like, oh, not only do we wanna go to the event, we wanna spend 70,000 to sponsor it. And I was like, well, definitely not. And uh, uh, they put together kind of, we call it a scope of work doc. I mean, there's different names of different, but it, at the end of the day, it's ROI. And it, it literally, I went from like, Definitely not to like, yeah, you guys need to go there right now. So here's some of their logic, plus some of my own conclusions on how to make the most out of conferences as an attendee or as a startup. <laughs> so this little case study revolves around Saster, which is the SaaS focused tech conference that has been happening in the Bay Area, I think since 2016. Saster focuses on companies that do software as a service. Pretty much any platform that your company pays a subscription to. It's a pretty standard conference slash trade show. You have, I think, three stages for speakers and some sponsors and some mingling area. And, and this year they made it outdoors, which is pretty cool because it felt like a little bit like a festival, uh, especially compared to the Lumi conference center or hotel. Now this video wasn't sponsored by them, but if the Saster crew is watching, it could be. <laughs> now, I don't have any stats on the mix of attendees and like on, on the demographics, but judging by the people I was, I was speaking to, it was mostly founders, some senior management of SaaS companies and other non-SaaS startups and EIPs. It's my term for entrepreneurs in progress, which I think is much better than entrepreneurs, which I've heard. Now, in previous years, I've attended these conferences myself uh, alone, but with a clear focus on learning, again, you know, to feel like I made some of my money back because it's such an expensive ticket, right? I used to create this little schedule for myself and then I would go stage to stage, take notes, you know, close the day exhausted. I went to the happy hour just for a beer and then I, I left, uh, I mingled a little bit and then I left back to the hotel to sleep. But chatting with people this year, most of them said that they didn't really care much about the sessions or the panels and they were rather looking for mostly to network and to speak to people, to meet fellow entrepreneurs and to meet potential partners. Now, I have to be honest, the whole networking thing, <laughs> the whole networking thing doesn't come too naturally to me. I wouldn't say that I'm an introvert, but I'm definitely not one of those that just approaches strangers and starts conversations. I sort of forced myself to do it this time. A little side note on that, around 30 different people came to me to say that they loved our videos, which is the most famous I've ever felt in my life. Hashtag influencer. But anyway, um, one thing that these events do get right is that they, they sort of compress this very niche, this very specific audience of like-minded people. They put them all together in the same room, they give them free food, and they give them free alcohol. And honestly, fun things happen when those variables are mixed. Now, that's when that value begins happening for sponsors because you're gonna have all these people locked up together in the same place for a few days. Now, startup booths are pretty much a standard in these trade shows. And companies spend a lot of money coming up with their cool designs, which company has the coolest swag, and trying to figure out how to move people into their booth to interact with them. And a couple of times in the history of Slidebean, we've considered, we've been tempted to do a booth at a conference. And the math we've always done is, well, how many Slidebean customers do we need to convert to make up for the cost of this booth at the super affordable pricing for our super awesome fundraising platform? We would need to convert a couple hundred customers with a booth. And that's where things stop making sense most of the time. Because if you push yourself, you might get 200 people to come to your booth, but there's no way you're converting those 200 people 
into a product, into a sale, into a subscription. So this is a dashboard that we had created and it cataloged the total number of conversations against goal. So my thesis around the type of company that does a booth was always products or services that have much bigger lifetime values that could more easily make up for the cost of the booth in the conference. If your customer lifetime value or your average deal size is $10,000, you really only need to convert 10 people to get a great ROI. And then 10 out of 325 conversations, that kind of makes sense. And honestly, a $10,000 lifetime value is, is not that hard to get. Um, you know, think of a product that costs $500 a month or, or a product that you absolutely never cancel. That's what many of these tools intend to become for their customers. And even though that makes sense in my head, like it turns out that according to most of the companies that I spoke to, focusing your conference booth and thinking about it as an ROI and, and money that you return often leads to a frustrating experience for everyone. I've worked at software companies that put ROI at the tippy tippy top and I've never seen that go well. <laughs> Be because your expectations are often really high and there are some variables that you can't control for. Now, curiously, the guys from Chartmogul approach conferences very differently. Their product is this SaaS analytics platform and as you can figure out, pretty much anyone walking on this event is a potential customer of theirs. So Sarah, their head of sales, set this rule or this, this policy of not quantifying ROI at all for the conference, which to my numbers driven brain is, is, it was a little bit crazy and hard to, hard to grip. And so we actually think um, in, in terms of conversations, because we can't control mm -hmm. for that status type, basically. We, we set a goal um, to have basically two to three quality conversations per person per hour at the show, which basically means that every 15 minutes, you're flipping to a new person. And so they created this little dashboard with measures on how many people they talk to, and they use that to sort of push themselves to that goal. But it's not a revenue goal. It's a conversations goal. It's focused on pushing the team to interact, but not necessarily on measuring their success based on sales. What are you doing for the conference? You're doing the restaurant. I, I saw that you guys were packing a bunch of t-shirts. You, pr you probably spent thousands of dollars on t-shirts and, and, and swag. Yeah, the t-shirts are um, a really good giveaway. Um, they're kind of a carrot for people to engage with us um, because you kind of need some soft openers. Like, what are you hoping to get out of the conference? Uh, I, I think just generally our approach is a little bit more casual and and the, the swag. Um, kind of helps with that. Now that seems to relate to visibility and to credibility about the company. And it also seems to relate to branding. Turn mogul customers are worth a lot to them. While not quantified, they understand that a single deal that they can get through this conference or a single customer they can retain translates into thousands of dollars, maybe tens of thousands of dollars in value. Now beyond the booth, they usually host a steak dinner around these events and they, they invite some of their key customers. And their focus on that dinner is being able to sit down for a more chill conversation about how their customers are using their product. And for us attending, it's it's a fascinating setting of peers. It's, it's fellow founders, it's fellow CEOs that can also lead to good partnerships and just good relationships. Now, those things happen here. They happen in person and they absolutely cannot be replicated on Zoom calls or by spending millions of dollars on marketing. It's a very different type of relationship that you develop in person at these events. Now, probably on the complete opposite side of the spectrum from, from an intimate dinner, you have the Absumo guys. Their product and their brand is closer to Slidebean in the sense that they sell to a massive audience. And they have a pretty uneventful booth, uh, but a not so secret after party. I have to pull out the exact receipt. You know, the, the bar net costs 5K. It, it, you know, my mom was like, Noah, it's so expensive. How could you have an open bar? They're gonna take advantage of you. One partner pays for like all of that plus you know, 20X. Now, like I said, you know, a single customer lifetime for AppSumo is probably in the hundreds of dollars. So the booth and this whole thing is not really meant for the customers, it's meant for the partners. I don't know, I think booths are really too passive. It's a little bit just like you're standing back and you have to wait for people to come versus active. And uh, what is the goal? So what's the outcome of the event? So the three things for, for AppSumo was get 15 select partners, which is what we call our white glove service, 20 self-listed, which are smaller partners who are up and coming. And then we want an ROI of $2 million. And they kind of broke down a little bit more in detail, like some of the costs about traveling and overall. And it was like, well, if they're gonna make 2 million and it's gonna cost us like 100,000 with you know food and Ubers and all that other stuff, uh, it's pretty much a no brainer. 
could you meet these partners in, in some other way that's not the conference? That that's more cost effective than the conference? A hundred percent. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. But the the efficiency of, of also getting a slice of that pie on it in person, like it's just a lot easier versus the amount of emails and DMs and LinkedIn messages people get. Uh, the right. noise, you're able to break through that seeing this person in, in person. So for both of these companies, it seems that the ROI and the tracking of the success on the event is connected to these internal success metrics, to how the event is processed, to how the decision making happens. But effectively, everybody understands that there's more value that they can probably measure. There's an intangible value, a brand value to hosting these events. What we know about the LTV of our customers is that if some of those folks convert, the conference in time will have paid for itself. But um, there's not a point in time where I'm going to say, okay, it's six months out, did we generate you know, 70K in MRR from Saster? Uh, we won't do that math. Now this time was probably the first time in my life that I got, that I feel that I got a lot out of a conference. I met part of the Breaking Bad cast back in South by Southwest a couple of years back, and I still don't think it was worth the $3,000 that we spent going there. But I did some things different this time, and I think they worked great. First, um, I attended fewer talks and I saved a lot of time and energy to mingle. So I attended about five sessions, only the ones that I really cared about, and I mostly mingled, went to the booths, you know, talked to the startups, many of them who happen to be our customers too. Second, and probably the most important change, I brought my team with me. We took the conference as an opportunity for team building. So we rented a hacker house in Mountain View and we stayed there for a couple of weeks even before the event. Myself and my other co-founders, we lived in Mountain View for a few months there when we were on 500 Startups. And I wanted the team to experience a glimpse of this Silicon Valley life. So the context of the conference was a fantastic opportunity to do, again, some team building, some bonding. And, and a good chunk of our team is, is already together. We all work from the San Jose office in Costa Rica and from the New York office. The guys from Chert Mogul, they're fully remote. So these events are really one of the only few opportunities they have during a year to get their team in the same room. Third reason is team friends. Beyond team building, attending a conference as a team makes a world of a difference. Going with a team and hanging out with your team from time to time sort of gives you a break from speaking to strangers. At least that's very important to me. Um, but more importantly, you have other excuses to connect with fellow teams. Now we befriended a bunch of people, mostly because we were a lively crew <laughs> and, and different team members found more things in common with other team members. I would not have achieved this if I had been there by myself. Now the fourth thing that we did different is understand how important the happy hour is. Some people would say that I like to drink <laughs> and, and I do, but happy hours are probably I probably like 50% of the value of the conference. I got to meet a lot of people just like on a very personal, hey, let's drink a beer together level. Yeah. And then making those business connections was just so much easier because like, hey, I already had a beer with you. <laughs> okay, let's talk business for a little bit. You know? <laughs> it's the place to make friends in the startup world, to make those connections. We went on this conference on a learning journey, not a selling journey. And we still happen to make sales on the happy hour. So I'm kind of a believer now. I always thought of these things as, as work, and they are. Conference is a lot of work and it's tiring, but looking back on Saster this year, I mostly had fun. So new policy, we are probably gonna attend every single startup conference we can find next year. Uh, we did a meetup in Dolores Park, which is really cool because some of you guys came in and, and that's kind of our game from now on. Now, I almost cut this section from the video and from my notes because it, honestly, it contradicts a lot of the things I've said in my previous videos. So I wasn't sure how it would fit, but anyways, I always thought of growth as growth hacking. You spend money here, uh, you measure it carefully, and you repeat it all over again. And that's that's how we always thought of marketing at Slipe. We always split the budget and budget and time really in direct response, which is about 80% of our effort and 20% for brand awareness. Stuff that we think has value, but that we can't possibly measure. And we understand that we can spend a little bit of money on that. And for the longest time, we've been a growth focused company. After our first round of funding, our largest team and most of our budget went to marketing and to growth. And that's, that's worked for us. It worked for us. It saved our company because when we ran out of money from the round, we became profitable. We were able to do that and we didn't have to raise more money. So it allowed us to grow. And now marketing and this YouTube channel included is kind of our secret sauce. Now, a bunch of talks at the conference were focused on product-led growth, focusing deeply on the product, building an almost perfect product, and then only then spending money and effort to sell that product. And this, these are teams where, 
what, 50% of the team is, is engineers. And by comparison, only 30% of our team is uh, our product people. And they rely on word of mouth and simply having a superior product. It's an approach that, that's honestly very new to me because I, I sort of formed myself into a growth hacker. But it's worked for companies, for a bunch of companies at the conference, including Turd Mobile. So the last axis here is, is brand. And that's a branch that I only recently started paying attention to. Again, we started this YouTube channel as a direct response campaign. We used to measure how much the video production cost and how much money we made from it. But measuring which video has converted you guys to something is pretty impossible. So all we know now is that you watch these videos and, and you love them and you know my name and you know Slidebean and you attend the meetups that we organize. And it's pretty incredible. And in the end, the money spent on these booths seems to be about that, seems to be about the brand, seems to be about staying on top of mind of your existing and potential customers. It's about developing more personal and more intimate relationships. And honestly, today, we as a company, we're all about that. So I still believe that the split between direct response and brand awareness should exist. But after spending all this time with these teams, it seems that brand awareness could be a much bigger chunk of change. We have the channel, right? We have the YouTube channel. So I don't know if we should be doing booths at all. You know our stats, you know our company. What do you think? <laughs>